Okay, we're gonna call the meeting to order. Kimberly, can you take roll, please? President Here. 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 Okay. We will observe our customary moment of silence. Okay. Lisa, will you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, may I have a motion to, for the approval of the agenda, please? So moved. Support. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Members of the audience may address the board on agenda items only. Seeing none, we will move to academic highlight. Exact path, Mr. Turner. All right, laser light show, get ready. All right. <laughs> Okay, so um, middle school has struggled with uh, state assessments over the past, well, 13 years. Um, we've had pockets and times where our scores were, were good, much better than the state average. However, last year, uh, definitely our scores were below even our expectations and, and we, we really struggled as teachers. What do we do? How do we improve our scores? How do we help our students? Especially when we're seeing that they are consistently below grade level in, in their overall performance. And we talked with Randy about what we could do, what, what options are out there, what assessments tools are available. And fortunately, I was able to convince um, Randy to spend some money. Thank you, Randy. Mm -hmm. And to try uh, a program called Exact Path. It's through Edmentum. And the program works where every student will be evaluated with math, reading, and language arts. It will uh, the tests take about 50 minutes each. It, it will start off at a kindergarten level and progress all the way up to a 12th grade level, depending on the student's uh, achievement or ability level. And roughly every student will have about 24 to 30 questions. And at the end, it will say student is performing at such and such a grade level, which will pretty much they'll tell us whether they're below grade level on grade level or ab above grade level. And it will also tell us exactly what benchmarks they're deficient or they need to work on. Now the beautiful thing about Exact Path is that it will help the teachers. So I'll, I'm gonna choose math because typically that's the most challenging. I'm a seventh grade math teacher. I have seventh grade benchmarks that I'm expected to teach the students. However, Within my class, I may have students that are performing at a second grade all the way up to, let's say, a ninth grade level. I mean, they're, they're that skilled. So how do I write lessons for every single individual student and at the same time teach the benchmarks that I'm, that I'm required to teach? That's a real challenge. Plus, if they're below grade level, how am I going to meet their needs and really how am I going to diagnose where they really are? I know they're below grade level. That's pretty evident but pinpointing exactly where they are and providing them the individualized support has been the challenge. So I, I have a packet for each of you um, and I will go through, I don't even know how to make this bad boy work. No, nope. yep, here we go. So I want a little history. Here's our results from the uh, 27th school year. In math, you're gonna notice that we have more that are not proficient and partially proficient actually in every, in every grade, sixth, seventh, and eighth. 80% um, are partially proficient or below. 
63 are partially proficient or below and uh, 73 in, in sixth grade. So, and that's pretty consistent year after year. Now, not going into the philosophy or the, you know, whether the validity, I should say, of the M-STEP, how accurate that is. And there are some challenges with the M-STEP, which I talked with the board about. How do I get the students more motivated to perform on that? That's, a, that's another challenge, but I'm, I won't address that today. But I just, you just needed to know that's where our scores were, and this is one of the real reasons we needed to do something to try and identify our, our students' needs. Mr. Turner? Yes. Can you give me an idea of just what the average M step for like math or reading? So I have a, a benchmark or something to know what 50% not proficient means or 7% to that. So I, I will tell you, I do not know the state averages. <laughs> Couldn't tell you. Um, I've tried to find that on the BAA website and I am not successful. Um, but I would say that if you look at, the, at, our, at our students, we should not have 50% of our population. This is just the Dave Turner standard. We should not have 50% of our population below proficient um, or advanced in, in my estimation. Um, one of our goals for every single teacher is to have the students score uh, grow by 110 points from their previous year. So just so you have an idea, we, we went through our, our data. If every student was just 10 points higher than where they were, we would have 75% of our population proficient or advanced. 10 points, that's all we're talking about. To, and there is not a, I don't know of any districts that have 70% of their population proficient, 70% proficient or advanced in, in, in every category. Now there might be a pocket of that, a specialty school or something like that, an academy that is pulling some of the best and brightest students. But I really believe there's 10 <coughs> points, 10 points to get to 70%. I think we can do it. Granted, we have some deficiencies that we need to work on, but also motivation on this test. Let's take it seriously and, and talking with Dr. Davis about how are, I'm gonna campaign with the community, get the parents and students more engaged in that, that process. Maybe enough to get that 10 points because frankly, we do have some kids that are just going C, 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 or not even answering. So that does happen. So I'm sorry, I don't know what the state average is, but I hope it's not that. Because uh, our state would be, I mean, really awful if that's uh, those were our scores were, and it's not because our teachers are not working hard. I want to make sure that's clear; they are doing their absolute best with the resources that they have. They are really conscientious in, in trying to reach all students. That's why we offer retakes. We all meet with students at lunch after school. There's a lot of support available. However, getting them there, we're still struggling with just because. I'm at a third grade level and I'm teaching eighth grade math. What do I do? Language arts, you can see our scores are better. Um, I'm at 57%. Not, not quite, I mean, we're almost at that 50%. Again, if you look at all the numbers, we're not quite 50% in language arts, although it is better. Science is only seventh grade. I just put that in there just because um, I, I wanted you to be able to see it in case someone asked, when do we teach or when is science evaluated? Seventh grade. Social studies is eighth grade. And you know, 78% not proficient in social studies. I know the concept is of social studies as I am a, also a social studies teacher. The concepts are not that challenging. Um, that's a different conversation on, on how or why our students are 70, 70 or I'm sorry, 68% are not performing at level, I, I don't get it. Um, so we've got to work on that as well. But as far as exact path, it doesn't address that. Other than the reading and language arts component may have a direct correlation to how students perform in terms of reading test questions because the exact path does use questions that are very similar to that on the M-STEP. 
All right, so here are our results on exact path. So if you look overall as a building, that's the first column, 72% of our population is below grade level across the board in math. Eighth grade, 70%, seventh grade, 76, and sixth grade, 70. So just reflecting back, if you look at our current eighth graders, they were 63% on the M step below grade level, so it's pretty, pretty close or not proficient, pretty close to that 70%. Seventh grade, right on, 76%. So the scores on how they're performing with exact path is pretty close to the scores on the M step in terms of those that are not proficient. With me? Mm -hmm. Giddy up. All right, language arts. 33, our scores are better here. We have uh, more students up on and above grade level with our language arts, which is excellent. It's what we want. Um, it is easier to differentiate language arts than it is math because math, you have specific benchmarks. With language arts, you have uh, targets that you're looking for and, and with multiple resources. If the theme is science fiction, I can find a, a resource for a student that is at various grade levels, whereas um, math, it is that standard XYZ grade seven. Um, it's more specific. But our, our language art scores are pretty good. Um, in fact, based on our M-STEP scores, if you below grade level, we had kids that were 54% in eighth grade on the M-STEP. So you can see that our, our kids are actually performing better in language arts on this exact exact path, which tells me our students probably can do a better job on the M step um, be, for whatever reason, and it might be, again, engagement, value. Seventh grade, 63%. If you look back, 63% are below grade level on the M step, whereas only 40% are uh, below grade level. So that also tells me that 110 target to improve our students, we should be able to meet that and we should be able to have 70% or so of our students um, proficient on the uh, M step. Oh, I keep forgetting to click reading. So um, this is, again, just our first test. Now, there isn't a reading assessment anymore with the M-STEP. It's kind of wrapped into the language arts component. So it was hard for me to, to extrapolate exactly what the percentages are. Why well, I wanted to compare the two, Edmentum, exact path to diagnosis with the M-STEP is just so you can see there is a correlation there. However, our kids are performing better on the exact path than they are in the M-STEP, and we've got to figure that out. But math is pretty telling. Those, those numbers are pretty close. All right, so I want you to be aware of how we're actually using exact path. Because our students need the support, and frankly, the teachers need that support too. I challenged every teacher this year that every student must have time on exact path because it can be done on a Chrome uh, a Chromebook, a computer, um, an iPad. Every student must touch exact path for at least 15 minutes once a week. Math has to be once a week, no matter what, for every grade, because our math scores are the ones that need the most attention. Language arts is another one that can be, what I said is every other week is fine. They can partner up with language arts and reading every other week. But if you look on our sheet, eighth grade math is at least every 30 minutes or every week for 30 minutes, every single student, even our Algebra One students are showing some deficiencies in areas where they're uh, below grade level. Um, language arts and reading every week for a full hour. So part of it might be language arts, part of it might be reading. So our teachers might, for example, might use a Friday uh, for that class. Seventh grade, you see every week, one hour. And during that time, what they'll do is they'll actually 
uh, group students. So this is another component that you get with the, with the Admentum. Because we're able to diagnose where the students' deficiencies, if I want to see which students are struggling with linear equations, or I'll even use something uh, better, would be uh, positive or negative integers. I can group my students, and this group right here, they're on or above grade level, that group over there doesn't. So I know that during this session when kids are on exact path or admentum, I can work with those three students specifically on that area or another area. Teachers are using this, there's a grouping function to help seat students, to work with them individually or in, in small groups. They're able to track their uh, individual progress, how much time the students are putting in, um, in and out of the classroom. And it, it's been really beneficial for, for teachers in terms of I know exactly what, what the student needs because before it was just I knew they didn't get it, but I didn't know how far below or how high they were before. Uh, sixth grade, you can see there how much. So everyone's meeting that target, and uh, the uh, initial response from the, from the teachers and the students is that things are working. We'll know a little bit more. I'm going to move to the next um, next or in January will be the second time that we're going to evaluate every single student. What exact path we'll be able to do is show us what kind of growth we've had. Is this working? Is this not working? Are we seeing that the time and the money, because frankly this is not cheap, it's a, uh, what is it, we're looking at down about 22,000? 19 this year, okay, uh, $20,000 for us to, to have this, which is not cheap, but the resources can be incredibly valuable if we're using it um, vigilantly. We're making sure that we are working with the students because just because you're on the, the uh, computer going through the, the software and the diagnosis and the practice individually, it is also that one-on-one -on -one interaction with the teacher. That's where the power is. And being able to group students and, and, and identify where their needs are and come up with strategies to work with them, that's the powerful thing. The other thing that we've noticed, if you look at the student use, students are actually able to track their progress too. They have uh, these little awards and trophies and it's kind of a gamey type system, but not entirely gamey. Uh, so students are able to work towards getting rewards, stickers, whatever you want to call them. And so the it, it helps incentive, motivate the students to be incentive uh, to do a little bit better job with in their engagement. We'll see, because January is the big tell. Are we getting growth? Are we not getting growth? Uh, which students are we really seeing some achievement with? Which ones are not? And then we can figure out what we need to do before, Jan or before April comes around, which will be the third time that we evaluate. And that's when we'll meet with Don and, and Randy to say, yep, yeah, we need to keep, please put this in our budget, or nope, it's not worth that 20 some thousand dollar investment. And, oh, I don't know how that got in there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, easy. Coal in your stocking. So, that's what we're doing. That's the reason we're, we're using this. This is how we're using it, and, or an exact path. Um, we're excited about it. Uh, and really, philosophically, the staff has embraced this, knowing that our students are behind for whatever reason. And we know that if, if we just keep plugging along, doing the same thing, working on the benchmarks at my grade level, we're going to continue to leave kids behind so we've got to change what we're doing, how we're teaching. That was another component that, that came from this because I'm able to target areas of student need or where students are very proficient and I start teaching in groups rather than just the, not, and I don't want to say that our teachers teach in a traditional lecture model because that's not accurate. But I'll say the traditional model in math, which might be warm up, here's a little bit of introduction on what we're doing today, practice, all right, come back, I'm gonna give you more information, practice, a little bit more information, now do evens tonight for homework. I mean, that's, that's the old school traditional model for math. What teachers are now doing is, 
maybe here's some information. I've got students grouped how they need to. All right, we're going to do some stations in our classroom, and based on where you are, where you need, they're going to then allow those students to work on those stations or allow them to work on exact path. And I'm coming to you three over here to work on areas that I know that you need some support, then I'm coming over to you. So it's helping, it's treating it more diagnostically and um, intentionally. Questions? Dave, um, under the prescriptive uh, support, individualized assess, um, when it details interventions that would be helpful for the student to work on, is that shared with the parent? And if so, intentionally, how is that shared with the parent? So different grade levels do, a, um, well, I'll back up. At, we just had um, our parent conferences, mm -hmm. and teachers actually printed out Here's your exact path. Some, not every teacher, but most of our teachers, here's your exact path diagnosis for your child. So you can see specifically where or how your, your student is functioning. Not every teacher did that, uh, but that is something that we definitely want to continue to communicate to parents and somehow correlate that to uh, the M step in trying to motivate parents to help instill the value in taking the M step as well. So I would say roughly about 34, well, almost 40% of our teachers um, did share that information with, with their, I mean, the students obviously had that, but parent conferences, they actually had that with the students. Just from a parent perspective, from going to the conferences, I, I thought it was hard to understand what this all was, and it says you can do it at home, but we couldn't figure out how to access it. It was just trying to look to see well, what is going on. Um, my student said that he's doing adding and subtracting integers, which his math teacher didn't really know why he was on there and was going to look into it because he's, he's doing fine in algebra. So, um, and he didn't seem to have problems with that in the past. So, like, I didn't really understand that. And then with English, it seemed like it put him way too far, like doing stuff that I felt like a 12 year old shouldn't really be doing. And then he was bombing all the tests. And I don't, I don't think he like gets Canterbury Tales type stuff. And so I felt like it, it, it may not have been suited for his needs and maybe that's just him um, or maybe the time. But it, it, it was a little bit confusing to me about what exactly it was. Sure. I, I did get the printout from English. I didn't get it from math. I still don't, I just don't understand how he's getting where he needs to be or if the teacher's working on him on this work because I don't, I don't think the English stuff, I don't, I just don't think that he'll get that. So let me address the math thing first of all. Um, if somehow on, on the assessment, whether it was the one or two questions that dealt with positive negative integers, did not, didn't meet the expectations, scored it wrong, maybe clicked the wrong button, whatever. However, um, every student, they have some practice, there's a little tutorial, there's um, uh, skills that they need to work on, and then there's an evaluation test that they take. Once they score 80% on that evaluation assessment, then they move on to the next area for that individual student that they need to work on at the lowest performing level they are. So positive negative integers, I, I don't know, what is that? fourth, fifth grade, something like that? I'm trying to think, so, somewhere in there, okay? So maybe the next issue or that they need to address might be a sixth grade benchmark. I don't, I don't know, but it will, it's pretty reliable in determining what students are missing. I'm gonna use my, my high school son as an example. Um, eighth grade algebra last year, um, having him do long division, could not do it had no idea how to do it. Tried to use some, I don't even know what method, lattice, something, I don't know, elementary could maybe help me out with that, but had no clue on what, how to actually go through and use the traditional algorithm to solve a, a division and division, fourth grade. I know that because my wife is a fourth grade teacher. So there are gonna be deficiencies just because my son was in algebra doesn't mean it, he just needs, and all the students need refreshers on areas that are 
uh, maybe specific to them, that maybe the day that we tried to teach it, uh, they, they missed it, I don't know. But it, it, is pretty, it is pretty accurate in terms of diagnosing where they're, what they need. Language arts, I'm sorry, you're gonna have, you had a question. I was just saying, so it's not like he's gonna be doing this for the whole semester, like mm -hmm. if he knows what he's doing on it and maybe clicked a button wrong, that the next time it comes up, there may be something else that he needs to work on. It's not yeah. just kind of stuck on there. So look at, think of it this way. You're, um, Positive and negative integers, got to work on that. There might be four or five, or here's a tutorial on how to do it. All right, so looks at it, got it, practice, three, four, five, practice, problems, ready for the mastery test. Takes the mastery test, scores 80% or better, moving on. So it, it's something like that could be done in an hour. Um, it just depends on how much practice they need. Did they get to that 80% or not? And the software, Will um, will help them with that. Now the teachers will see. So I'm going to pick the can the language arts component. Teachers are going to see students that are struggling on a specific target, and what they what they should be doing. Again, we're still learning. What they should be doing is seeing those students or identifying those students that are struggling to master a test, and group with those students. All right, talk to me. What do you know? Here's really what they're trying to get you to do here. Let's practice this together in our grouping because that's one of the functionalities in Exact Path. And now let's put you back in. I'm going to open it up, do the practice, do the tutorial. All right, and now take that mastery test again. Get to 80% and you're moving on. It is not supposed to replace the, 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 the teacher. It is only supposed to support the student and the teacher and identify areas where they need, where they need uh, to work on some deficiencies. So I'm not going to say that this is the magic pill and it's going to fix every, every issue we have. <coughs> Honestly, we, we still have work to do to how, you know, how to integrate this. I'm forcing teachers' hands in terms of every week, everybody's got to use it. We are using PD. We've already had two professional development on, on exactly how to use that. We are going to continue to do that again. Um, in our upcoming two-hour early release so that not only do the teachers benefit, but most, most importantly, the students and parents. So we are, I'm, what I'm hearing here is I need to do a better job of <clears throat> communicating access and communicating what do these scores mean. Right, yeah. So which I can do that in, a, in one of my weekly updates. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I love when you sent out the emails, and I think that would be a perfect subject matter for one of the emails or a separate email. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm guessing it has access somewhere to, I, I love power school, so I use that. I know what's going on with my kids all the time. So I'm guessing this has similar um, updates that you can go and see what, how the kids are doing. Yeah, I mean, so, in, yeah, in fact, you, you should be able to see as a parent exactly where, what their needs are. You may, I don't know that there's a parent portal for exact path, don't know, but you should be able to use your students login information and see, this is what they're working on. This is what they need help with. And there's no reason why you can't either. It's a website you have to go through. There's three little login information that you need to have, and, and I can share that with parents. But every student has it. Everyone has their username, their password, and the kids are on it. So reinforcing parent awareness and their understanding of the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, the three overarching uh, goals that we talked about in the um, school advance process for um, evaluations administratively, uh, positive relationships with um, teachers and their peers, uh, student engagement in the learning process, and uh, student ownership of their work or their outcomes. This allows students, when they monitor their own progress, they see the goals and they see how they're working toward the goals and whether they accomplish that test to get themselves tested out of uh, of those um, those areas, they find value in that and see that progress. Ultimately, with with parents' awareness of this, it's going to raise the stakes a little bit more for the um, M step, so that the kids value the purpose of hey, I I got this far on this on this track and in my progress. I want to make sure that I'm still there when I take the M step, 
and they get the results, we'll be able to um, uh, put it two to two together. So the kids are taking those testing experiences more seriously, and they're more in control of it, and they understand what the outcome means for them. I think that's that's a, a major issue that we have across the state, but in our district, we need to make sure that kids are valuing and um, respecting that testing process, honoring that, and doing their best work. And um, not saying that everyone's not, but it, it is very easy for kids to just kind of check out during that process because there's no consequence to it. And the state's reluctant to put in consequence on it, nor does the district want to do that. So the question is, can we use those testing opportunities to be able to gauge how the kids are progressing? And can they take ownership of that? And I think that's really critical in this situation. Absolutely. I think the other piece from a parent standpoint is, with the MSTEP, it's really difficult or maybe impossible to how to help your kids study for it, how to help prepare them for it. Mm -hmm. Where this, I like the idea of you're knowing where their struggles could be, and, and you can see a progress. You can point out that they can work on this or you can work on that. So. And the questions should, are are similar. The format, the style, and the fact that it's online should help take away some of the, let's say, anxiety or lack of knowledge or skill on on how to take. For example, the M-STEP online, last year was the first year we did that. I don't want to say that that was the variable as why we didn't perform where we needed to, but that is another piece of the component. And we've always heard how we evaluate students using teacher-created assessments are not always similar to how M-STEP or state assessments look. So the more opportunity they get to practice those types of challenges or experiences or questions, the we hope there's a direct correlation to how they perform on the M step. Any other questions? All right, I'm sticking the dismount. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, sir. You want me to just leave that up? That's a great picture. Um, <laughs> you can if you want. Okay, we're going to move to consent, the consent agenda. Um, we have minutes and disbursement. Randy, you want to go through some of the background? Sure. Um, Approval of minutes and disbursements are self-explanatory. We do have a um, employment, uh, Katie Stahl, math teacher at Marshall High School, being offered the position. I'll mention her a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> contracting services with Linda Bennett. Linda's been working all year long, but we have not solidified a contract. Um, so that's being submitted for approval um, for this current uh, calendar year. The workshops, um, uh, the MASB, Michigan Association of School Boards, obviously has a, a whole litany of workshops for board members to take advantage of. I want you guys to all know that, it, you know, we encourage you to do that if you're so inclined. Uh, it'll be on your own time, but, but we'll be able to help you get registered for those and get you, get you set up. Um, and then, of course, I'm requesting the attendance of the Midwinter Conference with MASA January 24th through the 26th. So it's my recommendation that we support these. I have a motion. Move for approval. Support. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll start with Larry. Yes. 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 Okay. Well, we're going to move to report of the superintendent. All right. Special recognition. Yeah. Um, Katie here? Oh, okay. Um, Katie Stahl is, uh, fills the position of math teacher at Marshall High School. Ms. Stahl attended Olivet College where she earned a Bachelor's of Arts in um, Actuarial Science. Um, Katie also has been subbing for us since the beginning of the year. Um, she's doing really well. I know that the recommendation from the high school was she's a strong um, teacher, has a good teacher presence, has good classroom control, that kind of thing. Uh, we're really pleased to offer that position. She, I might, uh, if she were here, I'd embarrass her, but I'm going to do it in abstentia. Uh, she was summa cum laude uh, out of Olivet as well, so uh, you know we know that she's going to be a good talent for us, and we're pleased to have her on board. Leadership team reports. Um, I'm going to leave you to uh, ask any questions you may have on that. I want to bring your attention in particular to. Um, the Director of Curriculum and Instruction uh, in that update report. You can see our um, 
our director, Don, is hitting the ground running, and so you can see some of the progress that we're making in that, that regard as well. I like that he has a, a cycle for reviewing and implementing things so we're not hit with a ton of costs all at one time for each of those different subject areas. So that was, that was nice to see. Right, and just remembering that Taryn's got the same thing for technology and we're gonna try to have to wrestle with that. Financially, aren't we, Becky? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a couple comments on these reports when I was reading through them. First of all, um, Scott, um, the little chick, and then knowing that you raised it and then they were eating it. Like, yeah, that just tugged at my heartstrings knowing. <laughs> like, when you wrote dinner on your picture, I was like, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, and then um, Michelle, I wanted to say congratulations on getting that free admission for next year's conference. So that's pretty awesome. Well, just overall, was everybody um, happy with the turnout for conferences this year? Did it middle school? I know you guys tried some different today, please. Did it end well? We were packed. Oh, were you packed? Okay. Yeah. So about the same or? Okay. Yeah, it's like 98%. Yeah. Cool. Another point of reference on these reports is Brad Shedd's report on um, grounds and facilities. Um, extremely busy. Uh, he has been filling in. In fact, I just texted this morning as I was over at the Opportunity High School seeing the heating issues that we have and, and I know that we're going to be on top of that. Um, but it's really helpful to have Brad's leadership um, as the interim uh, working through this process with us. So that's great. Awesome. And those of you that are doing um, Battle of the Books, if you guys need help in any way, please let me know because I love that program and I'm glad that we're doing it in the elementary. So if you need help in some way, an extra set of hands, please let me know. Anybody else? Ben, I apologize, and I'm going to call you out on this. Did you did you include um, the uh, accreditation process we went through with the early middle college um, at the state in your report? Um, no, because I think it was after we submitted, so. Okay. We didn't get, we didn't get it until this, just this week. So we just received the letter that we, you want to say what we did? Actually, Kat did all the work. So uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Kat, <laughs> yeah. yeah. you want to want to say what we? Um... Sure. Um, after or during the third year, um, early middle college is set to do a forty-five minute presentation to the Michigan Department of Education and the Early Middle College <coughs> Association of Michigan. So we went a couple weeks ago and did that and. Randy and then Kim is our main coach, and then <laughs> um, Sherry Beavers from KCC and Angie Betts also were there um, as supports. And so we had to show a lot of data from our program for the last few years, and uh, then we decide if basically if we can move ahead with one point, and the other is the students get something called the Enhanced Health Certificate when they graduate. And so this would be, um, let's say they haven't gotten a full associate's degree or something like that, they would get this to say they did at least the 15 hours of credit for the Early Middle College Association. So that's kind of the minimum uh, to show that they have, that we can achieve that. And so we got our approval and found out last week, Monday. After the report went to print, because I just read yeah, the report real quick. <laughs> Well, congratulations. That's Thank awesome. Yeah. You didn't call anybody else? Nope. <laughs> um, we're going to go to discussions. STARS Resilient Schools Grant Initiative. Yeah, um, I handed out a, a quick uptick, but I'm going to I'm going to talk about this verbally so people in the audience can understand. Um, this is a quick update uh, from Derek Allen, the project director and now Vice President of Programs at Star Commonwealth. He's also the Director of the um, Global Learning Network and uh, is our Project Director for the Resilient Schools. So I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just read these things, but I wanna talk about the, the last couple of the points. 
Since August, all but four newly hired teachers have received trauma-informed training, and that was across the district. The counselor has received trauma-informed as well as mind-body skills and healing the experience of trauma training. All teachers and teacher assistants have been exposed to brief trauma-informed professional development. The behavior interventionist is also trauma-informed and attended the TLC conference during the summer. We sent a, a, t a small team to the uh, conference that was going on. It was uh, basically a state conference. Several teachers have been trained in mindfulness uh, by an expert on the topic who has visited the school and ran classroom activities on three separate occasions. All classrooms in Harrington have a comfort uh, corner area where children can take a sensory break. Many teachers use, are using brain ba breaks throughout the day and incorporating mindfulness into their classroom routines. You know, we also implemented um, Sanford Harmony as well as a, as a starter for the day um, and could be utilized throughout the day. Many teachers hold daily class uh, meetings that focus on problem solving and relationship building and are incorporating an SEL curriculum into their um, schedule um, that is also supported by um, Sanford Harmony. The behavior intervention team is using the circle of courage inventories to help write resilience plans for students as a tier two intervention. Teachers are beginning to use trauma-informed language such as triggers, amygdalas, uh, fight, flight, or freeze, sensory needs, mindfulness, hyper, hyper arouse, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is um, they're beginning to look at children through the needs-based lens rather than the disobedient lens. Our next Lunch and Learn will focus on how trauma impacts the brain and ways to help integrate both um, hemispheres into our classroom instruction and lessons. In the next few months, we're hoping to train more staff on trauma's impact on the brain and how it affects learning as well as strategies to use in the classroom. The counselor is also uh, going to begin using mind-body skills with students and we're designing more sensory areas for classroom use. Two parent meetings have also been held to introduce and explain the project as well as to connect families with available resources. Plans are being made to host a series of parent academies where parents can receive similar training to that which has been provided to the teaching staff. Parents are also being uh, polled now to determine when, where, and how to make those opportunities the most accessible and helpful as possible. Along with his overall, um, uh, Mr. Giles and Mr. Turner joined uh, Derek and I uh, on a one-day road trip to Indianapolis and back to go see a school, a charter school that is actually one of the Resilient Schools models. Um, it was really helpful to go down and see. We came back with some ideas uh, that could be helpful for us, in particular around title, dollar expenditures, and support in the classroom. Um, we were pleased about the climate and culture of that building. Um, uh, it was really evident that the teachers were tied into this process. They had a sensory uh, room for students to um, take a time out if they were starting to cycle and, and, and regroup themselves before coming back in the classroom. Um, they had a really unique model uh, for kindergarten through thir third or fourth, Robert, fourth grade where they had two teachers in each classroom. Um, they would split them and they would join together. They were doing true to, uh, uh, team teaching um, and they were able to leverage the resources through title to do that. Um, so anyways, it was a, it was a great trip uh, worth our time. I also wanted you to know that I've been working with um, under the uh, Resilient Schools grant uh, with Star Commonwealth's Research and Evaluation Department to design and um, create a, um, a, a reliable and valid uh, survey, which we call the environmental survey for students in their classroom and all their, also their building and also for um, the adults that are in charge of them. So the questioning is gonna come from uh, uh, actually available for all grades. It's, it's really touchy and, and challenging to try to come up with legitimate questions and answers for kindergarten and first, um, but there's ways that we can do that. And we hope to have that model rolled out so that we can start surveying our kids about the climate and culture in their classroom, about their experiences in the building. And what you do then is you have a teacher also do it from their perspective of their classroom and then you take a look at the results. And if there's any major variances, you have a, uh, uh, 
a critical conversation around that and why we suppose there's such a difference of opinion in the way we perceive our climate and culture. Um, I'm hoping they have that rolled out yet this year, uh, not 2017, but this, this school year, 2018. And then um, uh, Derek has given me an expanded um, proposal to be able to use consultation and direct services to some level uh, at each of our other elementary schools in the middle school. And the expectation is it's been requested by administrators, it's also been requested by teachers of getting additional supports for our kids in the other buildings as well and for teachers to have a little bit more coaching about how to um, do interventions in their classrooms as well. The overall plan was to do that year three and year four. Actually begin at year two, we're actually doing it a little earlier than that because of the uh, request coming in from our different buildings. So we're looking forward to more and more partnership in that. There's gonna be a presentation at the um, diversity committee um, coming up in uh, first part of, well, actually, do you know the date? December. December 17th or something like that? Seven. Okay, middle of December before the holiday um, where we're gonna do a full presentation. Um, Robert and I will be there uh, from Harrington and Derek Allen will be there, but we'll take the lead on that presentation on how we think it's being rolled out and how we think it's being impactful. Do we have that on our events? Is that on the event? I don't think it is. We will get that on there for you. That's at Star, right? Yeah, it's going to be at Star Common Law. Hmm. December 7th at 6. Is it December 7th? Yeah. Is there a problem if we all show up then? Hmm? Is there a problem if we all show up at that? As a board? Technically, right? Certain um, occasional or social occasion. Yeah, if you're there to, to listen and not make board decisions, I think you'd be fine. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. so separate tables. We'll sit <laughs> corners, opposite corner. <laughs> so I have a planning meeting coming up on the 1st. It's coming Friday, and then, yes, it is on the 7th at 6 o'clock at Star Commonwealth. Um, Randy, is there anything that the comfort corners in the classroom, or, or maybe Robert, this is a better question for you, like the redirection center, is there anything that those areas need for those students, why they're in those particular areas for whatever purpose they've been guided to that area or to that room? Is there any needs that are still left? Uh, I'm sure there is, uh, because we're just rolling that out. And when we saw the sensory room uh, and some of the equipment that they use in the sensory room down there in Indianapolis, it's really helpful. I mean, there's compression buses, vests. Uh, there's a, there was a really cool toy for younger kids that was heavy, and they could sit with it, hold it on their lap, which is calming for a lot of kids that are having cycles. Um, there's probably a number of things that we could look at, but uh, we'd like to be a little bit more um, uh, regular in the way we approach that so that we um, can take a look at what's useful. When you finally do get that list, I'd be interested in seeing it. Great. I'll let, I'll let you guys know on that. Appreciate that. You said that was December 7th at 6 p.m.? Yes. At Star. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us what you mean when you say there's cycles? I'm sorry? You just keep using the term there's cycles? Oh, just when kids get into a cycle, whether they're frustrated or they're um, angry or they have uh, jealousy and, and what gets them into their behavior cycle where they're not thinking clearly, the emotions taking over. Uh, they're not, Escalating. Yeah, and they're not, they're not um, cognitively addressing the issues because they're, they're, they're wrapped up in the emotion. Those are times where kids can take themselves out, get to a common area find what works for them. Some, a lot of kids like to be under something or in something. Um, I know down there in Indianapolis, they use a little pup tent. There are other options that we actually are using. Um, so whatever gets the kid comfortable, the young student comfortable, where they can regain composure, think through a little bit more. Once they're able to kindly uh, think through that and to verbalize a little bit, then they're able to come back into the classroom learning environment. They're not, this way they're not leaving the classroom, they're actually there, able to do that as long as they're not being disruptive to the rest of the students. And then Derek, when he presented, it was in July or something like that, he said that there was going to be benchmarks to really 
assess if this is working or not? Is that what the the tool that you're making, is that to be the benchmark? No, he's got different ones on goals and benchmarking, and we're going to have to take a look at that and review, and I think on Friday is when I'm going to start looking at those things. Um, this is separate to that because... One of the things we want to do is, if you're working with climate and culture, how do you evaluate that? And, and how do you get it consistent enough that you can actually use that information to help improve the, the learning, teaching and learning environment the kids are in? The best way to do that, and the only really way to do that is through surveying. And so you need to make sure it's a legitimate survey, the questions are asked correctly, they're consistently asked, um, and that's what we're working on with their department. And that's covered under the cost of the grant, which is really helpful because it's a pretty heavy lift for the evaluation department to come up with a new tool. Of course, they're researching what tools are already out there. There may be something we could just go ahead and pick up that way, but we'll see where, what comes of it. I can help you there. I got to get uh, hardware on this one. Okay. I think, I know they have the secondary one, but I believe that they can also apply to elementary as well. It's specifically called the climate. Yeah. And the, the about. Um, I'll research that and get back to you. Okay. Um, and the evaluator, um, Scott, over at STAR is already doing some of that. So um, if you have that suggestion, throw it to me and I'll throw it to her. Okay. Right. Just an observation. I think we need to continue to communicate what this is and why we're doing it. Um, just witness one of those fascinating Facebook conversations about whether we should bring corporal punishment back in the schools. And there are an interesting number of people that think we ought to just spank kids all the time and that's how we should deal with them. So, I mean, I, I, I like everything we're doing, and I, but I, I think we just need to keep educating people. I, I become more convinced every time I, I hear another another piece of it. So, mm -hmm. it's uh, probably one of the things that you'll never get fully explained the way it needs to be explained, but keep, keep doing it, so. Yeah, good. I think it's working pretty well. Uh, it's, 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 a, just, it's just the way we do things. It's a bigger students. struggle at the beginning before you get it established, and once you get it established, it's really interesting to see how it de um, decreases the stress that the kids are under and stress that the teachers are under. Um, witnessing the charter school down in, in Indianapolis, it was very interesting because they had just gone. Through. In Indianapolis, you can charter a school through city government. And um, so the city of Indianapolis chartered this school. Yeah. And it's an inner city school, um, primarily white and Hispanic. Uh, all of them, uh, all the students pretty much register under um, economically disadvantaged. And um, most recently, another charter school ended up having to close their doors because of um, performance issues. And they brought over about 68 students from that charter schools, so it's about as close to an annexation as you're going to see and between charter schools. And they ended up doing that and uh, brought over a number of children of color that had not been in that school before. So their experience has been six months of transitioning in that process and um, making sure the kids are heard, they feel welcomed and connected and so forth. And while they still have normal horseplay and behavioral issues like those kind of things, we also have students that were able to articulate what their cycle was, what they do uh, when they when they lose control, um, what how the sensory room is helping them, or or how that timeout room or redirection room is helping them because they have both. Um, so the other thing is they have a full time person that runs that sensory room, which is really um, an interesting uh, concept because she's a, a clinical or a social worker that works in that in that regard with these kids on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis within that room. Our volume, they have um, 800 students, K-8, in that school. Um, and so we need to take a look at some of their models of what they've already put in place and what they find successful. The trip was well worth it. Any other questions? We'll move to public comments. Anyone who can speak on any topic in uh, no more than three minutes. We'll move on to board member comments for which no action may be taken at this meeting. 
I actually have two. Um, one is um, I would encourage all the administrators to encourage their staff. Um, we just got done with the um, Binda Foundation grants through the CISD, and um, it's always interesting to me to see who applies for those grants and who's been awarded grant money. And I know that there's a lot of teachers and um, staff here in our district who are doing some really amazing things. So next year, um, they're usually due sometime um, in October. So just encourage your staff to um, apply for those grants through the CISD and it's funded through the Venda Foundation. But there's <coughs> a lot of money and sometimes they don't get, um, all the money's not given away because there's just not enough people who apply who meet the qualifications. So um, it's some really good resources for grants. So I'll just pass that along. And then- What um, was that source again? Just it's, uh, it's through the CISD, but it's through the Binda Foundation. Um, and that, yep. And I can get you more information. They'll do a workshop usually in October on how to fill out the grant, and you get like extra points for going to the workshop towards your grant. So then there's a committee that will read the grants and rank them, and then they just basically put them in order and how you use points down, and then you can get up to a thousand dollars for a project. So it's yeah, it's, it's the email of the grant. Yeah, and sometimes if you can do like part one and part two, two people can apply with the same grant that's the same thing and get two thousand dollars. Our project so there's different ways to do that but yeah I'll get you more information and then the second thing was uh, reading the reports and this is transportation um, you know how we always read Facebook and there's always like why are we having a snow day today and there's some great information in there on how snow days are called and I don't know if we can maybe put that on the Facebook page so that other people can read it ahead of time before we actually have a snow day and mm -hmm. then there's not all the complaining on you know, why are we canceling today? Because then they actually see all the stuff that goes into making that decision instead of just complaining about after it happens. Well, it might decrease some of the complaints. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> True, Boring probably won't stop. Yeah. But at least that way people are informed ahead of time and they realize, okay, maybe this is why we're having a snow day right. today. So maybe that would be helpful to put that in there. I was happy because they tagged Bill Knox with me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, we're adjourned.